In monotheism and henotheism, God is conceived of as the supreme being and principal object of faith. The concept of God, as described by theologians, commonly includes the attributes of omniscience, infinite knowledge, omnipotence, unlimited power, omnipresence, present everywhere, omnibenevolence, perfect goodness, divine simplicity, and eternal and necessary existence. God is also usually defined as a non-corporeal being without any human biological gender, but the concept of God, actively as opposed to receptively, creating the universe, has caused some religions to give him the metaphorical name of Father. Because God is conceived as being invisible from direct sight and not being a corporeal being, God cannot, some say should not, be portrayed in a literal visual image. Some religious groups use a man, sometimes old and bearded, to signify or symbolize God or his presence because of his deed of creating man's mind in the image of his own. In theism, God is the creator and sustainer of the universe, while in deism, God is the creator, but not the sustainer of the universe. Monotheism is the belief in the existence of one God, or in the oneness of God. In pantheism, God is the universe itself. In atheism, God is not believed to exist, while God is deemed unknown or unknowable within the context of agnosticism. God has also been conceived as being incorporeal, immaterial, a personal being, the source of all moral obligation, and the greatest conceivable existent. Many notable philosophers have developed arguments for and against the existence of God. There are many names for God, and different names are attached to different cultural ideas about God's identity and attributes. In the ancient Egyptian era of Atonism, possibly the earliest recorded monotheistic religion, this deity was called Aten, premised on being the one true supreme being and creator of the universe. In the Hebrew Bible and Judaism, He who is, I am that I am, and the Tetragrammaton, yod heh vod -Heh, which means I am who I am, He who exists, are used as names of God, while Yahweh and Jehovah are sometimes used in Christianity as vocalizations of Yahweh. In the Christian doctrine of the Trinity, God, consubstantial in three persons, is called the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Judaism, it is common to refer to God by the titular names Elohim or Adonai, the latter of which is believed by some scholars to descend from the Egyptian Aten. In Islam, the name Allah Al-El or al ela the God, is used, while Muslims also have a multitude of titular names for God. In Hinduism, Brahman is often considered a monistic deity. Other religions have names for God, for instance, Baha in the Baha'i faith, Wahagura in Sikhism, and Ahura Mazda in Zoroastrianism. The many different conceptions of God and competing claims as to God's characteristics, aims, and actions have led to the development of ideas of omnitheism, pandeism, or a perennial philosophy which postulates that there is one underlying theological truth of which all religions express a partial understanding 
and to which the devout in the various great world religions are in fact worshipping that one God, but through different overlapping concepts or mental images of him. In Greek mythology, the primordial deities are the first gods and goddesses born from primordial chaos, or from Kronos and Ananke, depending on the source. Hesiod's first are Chaos, Gaia, Tartarus, Eros, and Nyx. The primordial deities Gaia and Uranus give birth to the Titans. The Titan god Kronos and Rhea give birth to Zeus, Poseidon, Hades, Hestia, Hera, and Demeter, who overthrow the Titans. The warring of the gods ends with the reign of Zeus. Based on Mount Othrys, the Titans most famously included the first twelve children of the primordial Gaia, Mother Earth, and Uranus, Father Sky. They were giant deities of incredible strength who ruled during the legendary Golden Age and also composed the first pantheon of Greek deities. Among the first generation of twelve Titans, the females were Nemosine, Tethys, Thea, Phoebe, Rhea, and Themis, and the males were Oceanus, Hyperion, Suius, Cronus, Creus, and Iapetus. The second generation of Titans consisted of Hyperion's children Helios, Selene, and Eos. Ceos's children, Lelantos, Leto, and Asteria, Iapetus' sons, Atlas, Prometheus, Epimetheus, and Maniotes, Oceanus' daughter, Metis, and Creus' sons, Astraeus, Pallas, and Persis. Like Cronus overthrowing his father Uranus, the Titans were overthrown by Cronus' children, Zeus, Hades, Poseidon, Hestia, Hera, and Demeter. In the Titanomachy, or War of the Titans, the Greeks may have borrowed this mytheme from the ancient Near East. A ten-year series of battles fought in Thessaly, consisting of most of the Titans, an older generation of gods, based on Mount Othrys, fighting against the Olympians, the younger generations who would come to reign on Mount Olympus, and their allies. This event is also known as the War of the Titans, Battle of the Titans, Battle of the Gods, or just the Titan War. The war was fought to decide which generation of gods would have domain over the universe. It ended in victory for the Olympians. In the ancient Greek religion and Greek mythology, the twelve Olympians are the major deities of the Greek pantheon, commonly considered to be Zeus, Hera, Poseidon, Demeter, Athena, Apollo, Artemis, Ares, Aphrodite, Hephaestus, Hermes, and either Hestia or Dionysus. Hades and Persephone were sometimes included as part of the Twelve Olympians, primarily due to the influence of the Eleusinian mysteries, although in general Hades was excluded because he resided permanently in the underworld and never visited Olympus. A 
characteristic feature of the Gnostic concept of the universe is the role played in almost all Gnostic systems by the seven world-creating archons, known as the Hebdomad. These seven are, in most systems, semi-hostile powers, and are reckoned as the last and lowest emanations of the Godhead. Below them, and frequently considered as derived from them, comes the world of the actually devilish powers. There are, indeed, exceptions. Basilides taught the existence of a great archon, called Abraxas, who presided over 365 archons. The ancient astronomy taught that above the seven planetary spheres was an eighth, the sphere of the fixed stars. In the eighth sphere, these Gnostics taught, dwelt the mother to whom all these archons owed their origin, Sophia, Wisdom, or Barbalo. In the language of these sects, the word Hebdomad not only denotes the seven archons, but is also a name of place, denoting the heavenly regions over which the seven archons presided. The Ophites accepted the existence of these seven archons. Complex hierarchies of aeons are thus produced, sometimes to the number of thirty. These aeons belong to a purely ideal, noumenal, intelligible, or supersensible world. They are immaterial. They are hypostatic ideas. Together with the source from which they emanate, they form Pleroma, region of light. The lowest regions of Pleroma are closest to darkness, that is, the physical world. The transition from immaterial to material, from noumenal to sensible, is created by a flaw, passion, or sin in an aeon. According to Basilides, it is a flaw in the last sonship. According to others, the sin of the great archon, or aeon creator, of the universe. According to others, it is the passion of the female Aeon Sophia, who emanates without her partner Aeon, resulting in the Demiurge, a creature that should never have been. This creature does not belong to Pleroma, and the one emanates two savior Aeons, Christ and the Holy Spirit, to save humanity from the Demiurge. Christ then took a human form, Jesus, to teach humanity how to achieve Gnosis. The ultimate end of all Gnosis is metanoia, or repentance, undoing the sin of material existence and returning to Pleroma. Aeons bear a number of similarities to Judeo-Christian angels, including roles as servants and emanations of God, and existing as beings of light. In fact, certain Gnostic angels, such as Armazel, are also aeons. The Gnostic Gospel of Judas, recently found, purchased, held, and translated by the National Geographic Society, also mentions aeons and speaks of Jesus' teachings about them. Watcher is a term used in connection with biblical angels. Watcher occurs in both plural and singular forms in the book of Daniel, 4th to 2nd century BC, where reference is made to their holiness. The apocryphal books of Enoch, 2nd to 1st centuries BC, refer to both good and bad watchers with a primary focus on the rebellious ones. The Aramaic Irin, watchers, 
is rendered as angel, Greek angelos, Coptic mala, in the Greek and Ethiopian translations, although the usual Aramaic term for angel, malaka, does not occur in Aramaic Enoch. The dating of this section of 1 Enoch is around 2nd to 1st century BC. This book is based on one interpretation of the Sons of God passage in Genesis 6, according to which angels married with human females, giving rise to a race of hybrids known as the Nephilim. The term Erin is primarily applied to disobedient watchers, who numbered a total of 200, and of whom their leaders are named, but equally Aramaic Eri, watcher, singular, is also applied to the obedient archangels who chained them, such as Raphael. The first section of the book depicts the interaction of the fallen angels with mankind. Shimiaza compels the other 199 fallen angels to take human wives to beget us children. The names of the leaders are given as Shemiazah, their leader, Arachiel, Ramiel, Kokabiel, Tamiel, Ramiel, Danel, Chazakiel, Barakiel, Aziel, Armeros, Bertariel, Basilel, Ananiel, Zachiel, Shamsiel, Satariel, Turiel, Yomiel, and Sariel. This results in the creation of the Nephilim, Genesis, or Anakim, Anak, giants, as they are described in the book. The Nephilim were offspring of the sons of God and the daughters of men before the deluge, according to Genesis 6-4. The name is also used in reference to giants who were said to inhabit Canaan, at the time of the Israelite conquest of Canaan, according to Numbers 13, 33. Meaning, princely offspring, or offspring of Anu according to the Oxford Companion to World Mythology, the Anunnaki are the Sumerian deities of the old primordial line. They are Chthonic deities of fertility, associated eventually with the underworld, where they became judges. They take their name from the old sky god An, Anu. By her consort, Anu, Ki gave birth to the Anunnaki, the most prominent of these deities being Enlil, god of the air. According to legends, heaven and earth were once inseparable until Enlil was born. Enlil cleaved heaven and earth in two. Anu carried away heaven. Ki in company with Enlil, took the earth. Their relation to the group of gods known as the Agigi is unclear. At times, the names are used synonymously, but in the Atrahasis flood myth, the Agigi are the sixth generation of the gods who have to work for the Anunnaki, rebelling after forty days and replaced by the creation of humans. In the Epic of Creation, it is said that there are 300 Agigu of heaven. The Anunnaki appear in the Babylonian creation myth, Enuma Elish. In the late version, magnifying Marduk, after the creation of mankind, Marduk divides the Anunnaki and assigns them to their proper stations, 
three hundred in heaven, three hundred on the earth. According to later Assyrian and Babylonian myth, the Anunnaki were the children of Anu and Ki, brother and sister gods, themselves the children of Anshar and Kishar, sky pivot and earth pivot, the celestial poles, who in turn were the children of Lahamu and Lamu, the muddy ones, names given to the gatekeepers of the Abzu, house of far waters, temple at Iridu, the site at which the creation was thought to have occurred. Finally, Lahamu and Lamu were the children of Tiamat, goddess of the ocean, and Abzu, god of fresh water. Agigi was a term used to refer to the gods of heaven in Sumerian mythology. Though sometimes synonymous with the term Anunnaki, in one myth, the Agigi were the younger gods who were servants of the Anunnaki until they rebelled and were replaced by the creation of humans. Sumerian paradise is described as a garden in the myth of Atrahasis, where lower-rank deities, the Agigi, are put to work digging a water course by the more senior deities, the Anunnaki. The Igigi then rebel against the dictatorship of Enlil, setting fire to their tools and surrounding Enlil's great house by night. On hearing that toil on the irrigation channel is the reason for the disquiet, the Anunnaki Council decide to create man to carry out agricultural labor. Dagon, deity of the Philistines, may have been cognate to Oannes, the concoction of Barosis, a Babylonian writer in the 4th century BC. However, Oannes was, in turn, related to Adapa, the fisherman sage of the Abgal, demi deities. As such, Dagon may relate to these Abgal as being carp-headed demi-deities, portrayed by men wearing fish-head hats, the progenies of Enki, as deity of the Abzu, waters. Likewise, some depictions of these Abgal sages as wearing eagle-head masks may have inspired the development of the deity Enlil, deity of the air and wind, into the deity Asher, and from thence into Faravarhar, the winged disc guardian angel concept of Neo-Assyrian era Proto-Zoroastrianism. Amos, in 1.8, sets the Philistines at Ashdod and Ekron, in 9.7, God is quoted asserting that, as he brought Israel from Egypt, he also, in the Hebrew, brought the Philistines from Kaftor. In the Greek, this is, instead, bringing the Philistines from Cappadocia. The deities worshipped in the area were Baal, Ashtarte, and Dagon, whose names or variations thereof appear in the Canaanite pantheon as well. Dagon is an ancient Levantine Canaanite deity. He appears to have been worshipped as a fertility god in Ebla, Ugarit, and among the Amorites. The Hebrew Bible mentions him as the national god of the Philistines, with temples at Ashdod and elsewhere in Gaza. At Ebla, 
Telmardique, from at least 2300 B.C., Dagon was the head of the city pantheon, comprising some 200 deities, and bore the titles B. Dingir Dingir, Lord of the Gods, and Bek Alam, Lord of the Land. His consort was known only as Bilatu, Lady. Both were worshipped in a large temple complex called Emu, House of the Star. One entire quarter of Ebla and one of its gates were named after Dagon. The Byzantine Etymologicon Magnum lists Dagon as the Phoenician Cronus. Samchunathion reportedly made Dagon the brother of Cronus. Both sons of the sky, Uranus, and Earth, but not truly Hadad's father. Hadad, Demarus, was begotten by Sky on a concubine before Sky was castrated by his son El, whereupon the pregnant concubine was given to Dagon. Accordingly, Dagon in this version is Hadad's half brother and stepfather. In Ugarit, around 1300 BC, Dagon had a large temple and was listed third in the pantheon, following a father god, an El, and preceding Baal Sapan, that is the god Hadu or Hadad, Adad. It is suspected that Dagon was one of the Seventy sons of El and Atharat that later sired Hadad, Baal. In the Hebrew Bible, Dagon is particularly the god of the Philistines, with temples at Beth Dagon, in the tribe of Asher, Joshua 19.27, in Gaza, Judges 16.23, which tells soon after how the temple is destroyed by Samson as his last act. Another temple, in Ashdod, was mentioned in 1 Samuel 5, 2-7, and again as late as 1 Maccabees 10.83 and 11.4. King Saul's head was displayed in a temple of Dagon. There was also a second place known as Beth Dagon in Judah. Joshua, 1541. Josephus, Antiquities 12, 8, 1. And War, 1, 2, 3. Mentions a place named Dagon above Jericho. The main temple to Enki is called E-Abzu, meaning Abzu Temple. Also, e en meaning House of the Subterranean Waters. A ziggurat temple surrounded by Euphradian marshlands near the ancient Persian Gulf coastline at Eridu. He was the keeper of the divine powers called May, the gifts of civilization. His image is a double helix snake, or the Caduceus, sometimes confused with the rod of Asclepius, used to symbolize medicine. He is often shown with the horned crown of divinity, dressed in the skin of a carp. Considered the master shaper of the world, god of wisdom, and of all magic, Enki was characterized as the lord of the Absu, Apsu in Akkadian, the freshwater sea, or groundwater located within the earth. In the later Babylonian epic, Enuma Elish, 
Abzu, the begetter of the gods, is inert and sleepy, but finds his peace disturbed by the younger gods, so sets out to destroy them. His grandson, Enki, chosen to represent the younger gods, puts a spell on Abzu, casting him into a deep sleep, thereby confining him deep underground. Enki subsequently sets up his home in the depths of the Abzu. Enki thus takes on all the functions of the Abzu, including the fertilizing powers as Lord of the Waters and Lord of Semen. Enki was considered a god of life and replenishment, and was often depicted with two streams of water flowing into his shoulders, one the Tigris, the other the Euphrates. Alongside him were trees, symbolizing the female and male aspects of nature, each holding the female and male aspects of the life essence, which he, as apparent alchemist of the gods, would masterfully mix to create several beings that would live upon the face of the earth. The Anki Temple had at its entrance a pool of fresh water, and excavation has found numerous carp bones, suggesting collective feasts. Carp are shown in the twin water flows running into the later god Enki. It is, however, as the third figure in the triad, the two other members of which were Anu and Enlil, that Ea acquires his permanent place in the pantheon. To him was assigned the control of the watery element, and in this capacity he becomes the Shar Apsi, i.e., king of the Apsu, or the deep. The Apsu was figured as the abyss of water beneath the earth, and since the gathering place of the dead, known as Aralu, was situated near the confines of the Apsu, he was also designated as Enki, i.e., lord of that which is below, in contrast to Anu, who was the lord of the above, or the heavens. The cult of Ea extended throughout Babylonia and Assyria. We find temples and shrines erected in his honor, e.g. at Nippur, Girsu, Ur, Babylon, Sippar, and Nineveh, and the numerous epithets given to him, as well as the various forms under which the god appears, alike bear witness to the popularity which he enjoyed from the earliest to the latest period of Babylonian Assyrian history. The consort of Ea, known as Ninhursag, Ki, Uriash Damkina, Lady of That Which Is Below, or Damgalnuna, Big Lady of the Waters, originally was fully equal with Ea, but in more patriarchal Assyrian and Neo-Babylonian times, plays a part merely in association with her lord. Among other conclusions, Giovanni Petianato found a tendency among the inhabitants of Ebla, after the reign of Sargon of Akkad, to replace the name of El, king of the gods of the Canaanite pantheon, found in names such as Mikael and Ishmael, with Yah, Mikael, Ishmael. Jean Botoro, 1952, and others suggested that Ya, in this case, is a West Semitic Canaanite way of saying Ea, Enki's Akkadian name, associating the Canaanite theonym Yahu, and ultimately Hebrew Yahavah. Some scholars remain skeptical of the theory, 
while explaining how it might have been misinterpreted. Yah has also been compared by William Hallow with the Ugaritic Yam, C, also called Judge Nahar, or Judge River, whose earlier name in at least one ancient source was Yah, or Yah-Ah. The Abkalu, Akkadian, or Abgal, Sumerian, are seven Mesopotamian, Sumerian, Akkadian, Assyrian, Babylonian, sages, demigods, who are said to have been created by the god Enki, Akkadian, Ea, to establish culture and give civilization to mankind. They were noted for having been saved during the flood. They served as priests of Enki and as advisors or sages to the earliest kings of Sumer before the flood. They are credited with giving mankind the me, moral code, the crafts, and the arts. They were seen as fish-like men who emerged from the sweet water Abzu. They are commonly represented as having the lower torso of a fish, or dressed as a fish. According to the myth, human beings were initially unaware of the benefits of culture and civilization. The god Enki sent the Dilmun, amphibious half-fish, half-human creatures, who emerged from the oceans to live with the early human beings and teach them the arts and other aspects of civilization, such as writing, law, temple, and city building, and agriculture. These creatures are known as the Apkalu. Ashur is an East Semitic god and the head of the Assyrian pantheon in Mesopotamian religion, worshipped mainly in the northern half of Mesopotamia and parts of northeast Syria and Southeast Asia Minor, which constituted Old Assyria. He may have had a solar iconography. Ashur was a deified form of the city of Ashur, which dates from the mid-3rd millennium BC and was the capital of the Old Assyrian Kingdom. As such, Ashur did not originally have a family, but as the cult came under southern Mesopotamian influence, he later came to be regarded as the Assyrian equivalent of Enlil, the chief god of Nippur, which was the most important god of the southern pantheon from the early 3rd millennium BC until Hammurabi founded an empire based in Babylon in the mid-18th century BC, after which Marduk replaced Enlil as the chief god in the south. In the north, Ashur absorbed Enlil's wife Nenlil as the Assyrian goddess Mulisu, and his sons, Ninurta and Zababa. This process began around the 14th century BC and continued down to the 7th century, when Assyria conquered Babylon in the Sargonid period, 8th to 7th centuries BC. Assyrian scribes began to write the name of Ashur with the cuneiform signs An Shar, literally whole heaven in Akkadian, the language of Assyria and Babylonia. The intention seems to have been to put Ashur at the head of the Babylonian pantheon where Anshar and his counterpart Kishar, whole earth, preceded even Enlil and Ninlil. Thus, in the Sargonid version of the Enuma Elish, the Babylonian national creation myth, Marduk, the chief god of Babylon, does not appear, and instead it is Ashur as Anshar, 
who slays Tiamat, the chaos monster, and creates the world of humankind. Enlil was known as the inventor of the mattock, a key agricultural pick, hoe, axe, or digging tool of the Sumerians, and helped plants to grow. Enlil, along with Anu, An, Inki, and Ninhursag, were gods of the Sumerians. By his wife, Nenlil, or Sud, Enlil was father of the moon god, Nana, Suin, in Akkadian, Sin, and of Ninurta, also called Ningursu. Enlil is the father of Nisaba, the goddess of grain, of Pabalsag, who is sometimes equated with Ninurta, and sometimes of Enbililu. By Erish Kegel, Enlil was father of Namtar. In one myth, Enlil gives advice to his son, the god Ninurta, advising him on a strategy to slay the demon Asag. This advice is relayed to Ninurta by way of Sharar, his enchanted talking mace, which had been sent by Ninurta to the realm of the gods to seek counsel from Enlil directly. As Enlil was the only god who could reach An, the god of heaven, he held sway over the other gods who were assigned tasks by his agent and would travel to Nippur to draw in his power. He is thus seen as the model for kingship. Enlil was assimilated to the north pole of the ecliptic. His sacred number name was 50. <laughs>